thanks Olivia and uh, Benjamin for inviting me to <laughs> this uh, wonderful place. And uh, this uh, is what uh, you could have seen if uh, during the blackout morning you escaped uh, the conference site, went to Chamonix. And uh, uh, that's the Mont Blanc, spectacular view. I should say that from the place where I come from, we are very familiar with snow. Uh, the only difference is Manitoba is totally flat. So we don't have this cable car. And sometimes on the street you do see some strange cars, and that was a photo which I took last year, uh, roughly at this time, uh, exactly in front of my house, actually. And if you zoom in, you see <laughs> the, the car is also quite uh, special. And from the direction the car drives and from the timing, I suspect very much the driver is one of our lazy students <laughs> who is late <laughs> for, for the class. My students are not so lazy and they are very subtle and they're doing very, very good uh, work. And uh, Li Hui and Bi Mu Yang, they just uh, went to China, become professors and establishing their own groups. Yongsen, Michael Harder, Paul Haider, Jing Wei Rao, and Sandeep Kao. Those are my uh, group of members who contributed to this work. So what I'm going to tell you is mainly about a quasi-particle, which we called as KVT Magnum Polariton. And then I will introduce another concept, which we call as KVT Magnum Quintuplet. And, uh, I numbered uh, my slides so that my friend uh, Eugene or Yaroslav, if you see any target, you don't have to pull your gun immediately. You can <laughs> <laughs> wait until the talk and uh, shoot me on that uh, target. Just to memorize <laughs> the number here. <laughs> and for the rest of you, uh, you know, it's a long conference. We learned a lot. And I guess it's now capacity is approaching full. So if you want to take a nap, this will be the slides that you take it a kind of take home message. Effectively, what I'm going to tell you is that if you lock magnon and a photon in a high quality cavity and you let them to have strong coupling, then you're going to forming this uh, strange particle which is called cavity magnon polariton. And that attracts a lot of attention in the past few years, and many people is trying to make use of that for different purposes, which I'm going to tell you. Let me start in from this community, probably very familiar ways. If you have a single spin, you put it in a high quality cavity, then this spin states, and if assuming that your cavity has a single mode, then these photon states and the spin states can have strong coupling uh, due to the Rabi interaction between these two systems. And we have learned many uh, wonderful talks during the week about this uh, important quantity, which is cooperativity. Essentially, is the Rabi frequency square divided by the dissipation rate of your spin and the dissipation rate of your cavity. And I actually calculated that this Rabi frequency for a single spin is about at the rate of one hertz. But I never realized the, the, the meaning of that until I learned this week during the conference. I realized the number of this rate is so small for a single spin is exactly the reason many of you can get funding. Because if this rate is high, then if you want to link a two NV center spin from uh, diamond, for example, you don't have to work on this nanomechanical system. You just need to put them in a cavity, then they or microwave cavity, then they will be already linked. But the reality is, of course, this Rabi uh, frequency for a single spin in a microwave cavity is way too <laughs> small. And so people are thinking about how to enhance that. A wonderful work was done by my friend Hans Kuber, who was here a few days ago. And he noticed that if you don't using a single spin, but if you're using the magnum modes, which involves 
many, many things uh, processing coherently, then if you look at the coupling of this magnon with the KVT mode, then you will find immediately the rapid frequency between the magnon and the KVT mode are significantly enhanced. And in fact, because the uh, number of the spin, if you take, say, a millimeter size of YIG sample, then you can easily reach the situation that the number of the spin is so high that your rapid frequency moves from one hertz to 100 megahertz. That's a very, very strong coupling. And that is essentially the reason why people get interested in that. And if you calculate the cooperativity, Hans measured that at extremely low temperature, and he found that the cooperativity for that coupling system can reach more than 1,000 easily, and you can further enhance it. Well, quantum mechanically, it's uh, relatively simple to uh, solve this kind of Hamiltonian where you involve many spins coupling with a single mode of the KVT. Essentially, you look at the fork states of your photon, and you look at these collective states of magnon, ground states, excited states. That is what we call as the ferromagnet resonance. And then if you look at the effect of this kind of coupling, what will happen is that now you have the combined states, the ground states, where your photon number is zero, magnon at the ground states. But your excited states can have an uh, effect of uh, level mixing. And if you're solving that, you will see that you have superposition states between the magnon at the excitation states, photon at the zero states, or the magnon at the ground states, photon, you have one photon, and there is a coupling between them so that you have the superposition states. So if you do the experiment, essentially you are measuring the transition of the KVT magnon polariton system and you can easily see uh, two peaks determined by the energy difference of the polariton excitation states uh, compared with the ground state's energy. Well, we're actually dealing here, as I said, with many spins. And in the quantum mechanical course, I remember when I was undergraduate students, my teacher, he was actually uh, a student of the Niels Bohr Jr. from Copenhagen. So he is very much keen on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. One thing he emphasized a lot, well I still remember, is the correspondence principle. That means if you have a quantum mechanical system, you move it to many body system, then you probably will find an alternative but equivalent to classical interpretation. And that is the situation exactly here. If you have this kind of KVT, classically, you can simply describe it as a LCR resonance that gives you KVT modes in a classical picture. And you have these many spins processing, and that gives you dynamic magnetization, also a quite semi-classical quantities. Of course, for people doing ferromagnet resonance experiment, we are very clear that this oscillating microwave current is going to inducing oscillating microwave magnetic field. And this oscillating microwave magnetic field is going to drive in spin processing. That's normally we care about for the ferromagnetic resonance. What we normally don't care about is the back action. The back action, what I mean is that if you have processional magnetic moment, then Faraday's law actually tells us that it's going to induce a high frequency voltage, which can drive in this LCR equation as the back action on the current you have. And this effect becomes actually very important if you have a KVT, because your uh, mode spectrum density is very, very sharp at the mode frequencies. So you have to take into account of both action and back action, and essentially mathematically, what you need to do is write down this essentially the LCR equation, give you the microwave mode with certain damping, 
and this magnetization dynamics you can write down in Landau Lifford's equation if you linearize it that gives you also a resonance with certain damping, give the damping. Now these two equations are coupled due to this action and the back actions. And the solution of that, of course, is very simple. Essentially, this is the coupled harmonic oscillator, and you find your eigenmodes is no longer purely microwave field or purely uh, spin precession, but instead you will have an eigenmode which is essentially a linear superposition of your uh, microwave dynamic and spin dynamics. So that's essentially the classical picture of the KVT magnum polaritons. And you can easily solve that. And with that, you also anticipate, of course, this is a classical phenomena that means at room temperature, you, you can also see that. And in fact, we measured that this kind of coupling, even at the room temperature, you can very easily reach a cooperativity up to 1,000. Because essentially, we have here a classical electrical dynamic effect here. And experimentally, what you can do is that you put uh, the low damping ferromagnetic material with many spins inside a high quality microwave cavity and you can use an external magnetic field to tune in the frequency of your magnum and the KVT modes of course is independent of the magnetic field whenever the magnum frequency approaches the KVT modes you see this anti-crossing showing that these two dynamics now are strongly coupled together and the cooperativity larger than one basically means this gap here at the crossing point is much larger than the line widths in this kind of measurement. So it's relatively easy, and in fact, that is calculated from this, and this is the real experimental data, and you can get very good agreement of that. So why is this interesting? As I said, one reason it's interesting is because the coupling rate is really, really high. Therefore, you can do a lot of the coherent uh, transducing functions by using this strong coupling. And immediately, and groups in Tokyo University realized that you can couple in uh, this system with superconducting qubit because people already know in the quantum information community that the microwave cavity couples very easily, very strongly with superconducting qubit. And once you do that, they have demonstrated you can actually transfer the information from the superconducting qubit through the microwave to the magnum system. That is quite interesting for the quantum community guys. And there are three groups almost simultaneously and independently realized that you can also couple in the magnons relatively easily with the optical light through the Kerr effect and Faraday rotation and so on. Then you have a situation that your optical light couples to magnon, magnon couples to microwave field. Then you have a transducer created by using the KVT magnon polariton. You have a transducer between microwave photon and the optical photon. And uh, they, they also find it uh, potentially very useful for the quantum inf information applications. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, um, magnetic optical effects, as we, for example, yeah, yesterday we discussed uh, the during the evening session actually intensively, intensively. And in my group, uh, we're coupling this system uh, with spintronic devices. I will show you one example why it could be useful for the strip spintronic people. And a few days ago, we heard this wonderful talk from Greg. Uh, that the magnum system, you can drive it to the langlinear regime. You have the bistability of the magnum system, effectively a duffing oscillator. Now, by using this coupling, you can actually converting or transferring this magnetic bistability into the photonic system to create optical bistability 
from your magnetic biostability, which we have recently demonstrated that. So very I'm, I'm sure there will be many more coming in the next few years because this coupling rate is so wonderfully high. And just quickly uh, mention how can you use and combine that with spintronic device. Essentially, we take a, make a microwave KVT. Then you can put a two spintronic device. We heard many talk already. Uh, this bilayer between platinum and the YIG, which can generate a spin current. If you put a two of such devices in one KVT and you let both of them coupling with the same microwave mode, even though between the two spintronic devices there is no direct interaction, you put them centimeters away, by coupling them to the same microwave field, you can essentially using one spin current to control a manipulated other spin current. That is also possible because of the strong coupling is so easily to reach in these systems. So far, everything sounds so nice, but uh, as we heard this morning also from Sebastian, I think, uh, there is always a prize. And, and here, uh, there is also a prize for this type of coupling, and actually two prizes related with that, which I will tell you. One prize is that everybody knows that if I have a single spin system, even though my uh, Rabi frequency is very low, but because I have a single spin system, I can easily saturate it. So if I send in to this system m more than one photons, I can easily enhance, actually, this coupling rate uh, due to the effect that the additional photon will have to force in this Rabi oscillation getting much faster because the system is already saturated. You have a single spin. And this capability is completely lost now in the many spin system. In the many si spin systems, the number of the polariton is much smaller than the total number of the spin. So the system is far from saturated. And in this case, if you're adding additional photon to that system, your rapid frequency is not changing at all. The only thing you're changing is you're going to produce a little bit more KVT magnum polariton. And experimentally, uh, I don't uh, show you this data, but you believe me that this uh, uh, rapid frequency is essentially totally independent of the microwave power you apply. So we lost this capability in the many body system. And associated with that, in the single spin systems, you can easily uh, approach the so-called addressed states. If you're looking at the four states of the photon, uh, n, uh, n plus 1, each of these states of the photon, of course, sees this two-level system, so they will have the rapid splitting. And if you look at the transition of that, you will typically see this type of Muller triplet, which tells you that you can access the dressed states of your uh, single spin photon systems. As Benjamin, actually, I remember last year, presented a similar result in Lake Louise conferences. And this capability is also lost here because uh, we cannot <coughs> reach this high uh, focus states, uh, photon states. Essentially, what we can see is this almost a single photon effect, which gives you these polariton states. You always see these uh, polariton twins instead of Muller triplet. And that's the punishment we have to take. Why do I mean that is a punishment? Because the priest has already said that there's plenty of room at the bottom, so everybody should go down to the bottom working on the single atomic or single spin systems. If we already have so wonderful room here playing with the single spin system, why would we want to come in back to this messy many spin systems? And uh, the reason for that is, well, as I told you, that in this system, we have this wonderful case, this rapid strong uh, oscillation getting coupling getting much larger. That's a wonderful thing. The only punishment we have is we lose, for example, the photon number contribility of the Rabi frequencies. Question we asked is, can we have 
at least one free lunch here in the manning spin system. In the same times, we have the enhanced Rabi frequency due to the manning spin, and hopefully we restore the uh, photon number countability like the single spin systems. Well, solid state physics sometimes do can enjoy free lunches. And <laughs> the reason is because uh, P. Anderson, Pope Anderson, had a wonderful article says that in the many body systems, very often you will have great and sometimes unexpected things emerge in these kind of systems. And here uh, we want to see uh, if we produce more, not just a single KVT magnum polariton, but we somehow produce many, many trillions of this quasi particle. Is there any free lunch that might emerge, which unexpected? And that is the second part of the story that I'm going to tell you. And effectively, the experiment we have done is that we first make a plenary microwave KVT, then we take a piece of Jäger sphere, put on top of that, let them have this strong coupling, and as I told you, this is giving you uh, this beast, the hybridized KVT magnum polariton. This we know how to do that. Then we do a step further. If you have a KVT, of course, always it has certain damping, dissipation, the photon will get leaked out of that. And we design another KVT, microwave KVT, collecting those leaked photon. And essentially, you have this kind of microwave current flowing in this second KVT. And in the microwave case, you can have many ways coherently enhance this, enlarge, amplify this current. So we amplify, essentially, this current, getting more coherent photon, and we feed them back to couple with this beast here. And when we're doing that, we essentially we can using the feedback photon to lock trillions of KVT magnum polariton, let them have collective dynamics. And they look very interesting, as I'm going to show you. So what is going to happen is that, as I told you, if you have a magnum transition hybridized with your single mode KVT mode, you get essentially the KVT magnum polariton. And in the first approximation, you can treat this as if you have two set of two level system. You have one set of two level system from ground states transition to the minus polariton states, and you have a second one transition to the plus polariton states. So in this case, if you feed many photons back into that system, your photon, of course, immediately sees these two set of two-level system. And as I told you, if the photons sees a two-level system, each of the Fox states will split, and then you will have this typical Muller triplet expecting to see, which effectively you see the dressed states. In this case, would be the dressed states of polariton, and uh, there is a second set of the uh, two-level system, so you expect to see a second set of Muller triplet, which is the second set of the dressed states, and then we do the experiment, and indeed you can wonderfully see, now you no longer have these relatively boring twin polaritons, if you switch on your gain, feed the photons back, depending on the feedback gain you have, you actually very clearly see one set of Muller triplet, and there is another set of Muller triplet, and they evolve in a different way. When you tune in the magnetic field, changing effectively the detuning of your KVT frequency with the magnum frequencies. And you're measuring this kind of quintuplet uh, dispersion instead of very simple twin dispersion of the polaritons. And I 
want to set myself as a target because I'm not so knowledgeable in this field. I want to claim this is the first time Muller triplet is observed in many spin systems. If I'm wrong, feel free to shoot me so that I can learn something afterwards. But anyway, so I can further convince you this kind of picture. You can write it down in the quantum mechanical uh, models. Quantum theory is always strange. Uh, classically, 3 plus 3 should give you 6. Quantum mechanically, 3 plus 3 will give you 5. If you calculate that, you see one set of Muller triplet and the other set of Muller triplet. And the dots here are measured and the curves here are simply calculated using this kind of physical picture. And I think uh, essentially this model captures the key point here. That's a wonderful thing because the indication that we see the dressed states indicates that the photon number now plays a role here. And indeed, if you're looking at the rapid splitting at the detuning of zero, you will find out that this rapid splitting in this magnum polariton system, when you're changing your gain, effectively if you're changing the number of the photon, you feed back to your KVT. And we see now, just like the single uh, spin system, the rapid splitting is wonderfully controlled by this photon number or microwave power in this case. Well, if you look at the ratio of the enhanced rapid splitting with the original, uh, not using this feedback method, the ratio uh, seems to be not so impressive. It is just 1.6. But remember that the cooperativity at one is already thousand. So using the photon, you can actually control the cooperability of that system from thousand to thousand six hundred. That's quite a, a significant uh, range for tuning. With that, actually, I come to my almost the final slides. And what I want to tell you is that more spin is better than a single spin in the context that if you're forming this KVT magnum polariton involving essentially many, many spins locked together, coherently interacting with your photon, then the rapid splitting is significantly enhanced. You're changing the rate from one hertz up to 100 megahertz. But you have a price to pay and you lose the controllability using the photon number to further control the rapid frequencies and that seems to be, can be resolved if you, instead of using one KVT magnum polariton, you produce, you're using the dynamics of trillions of polariton direct, uh, mm, KVT magnum polariton by using this kind of feedback uh, KVT technology, which we developed. And in this case, indeed, you can again restore the controllability of using microwave power or the photon number to control the uh, magnum photon or spin photon coupling rate. And the simple message is, as the Pope has said, the more is perhaps in the solid state system, perhaps is indeed makes sometimes different and give us the sometimes free lunch. With that, I conclude uh, my uh, talk. Thank you very much for your attention.